Hello. Hi. Thanks for coming, everybody. Welcome to Anchored Science Pub. We really appreciate your support. So I have several announcements tonight, and I'm going to try to get through them as quickly as possible before we start. We're looking for volunteers. If you guys are interested in coming and helping out with the program, being on the board of directors or anything else, we could use the help. We meet once a month, and usually, I don't know, probably spend an hour or two a month working on the projects. So if you guys want to help, that would be really great. I also want to mention that on March 20th at 5 p.m., we're going to be holding our annual meeting. So what that means is that we're going to be electing our officers and our board members. So if you want to come and vote, everybody here is welcome. Please come and check that out. I also want to give thanks to our sponsors. So the Taproot, of course. They give us this venue for free. Yeah. yeah. They provide gift certificates for the trivia winners and for our presenter. And I just can't tell you guys how much they support us and how much they've helped us out through the last four years. And we've been doing this about four to five years now. So we appreciate their help. I also want to mention Alaska Commons. Uh, they're an online magazine, and they cover everything Alaska-related. So especially with um, politics, po po political journalism, they're really well known for that. You guys should go online and check them out. The other sponsor we have is UAA. They help us with putting their events on their calendar and getting their staff to help us be presenters. Another thing I want to thank you about is all the donations that you guys have been giving us. Um, we ask for a $2 suggested donation at the door. That helps support run these events. But we found out recently after we checked our accounting and everything that we had some extra money. So what we decided to do was sponsor the Intel Science Fair for kids in high school. So we've made a $250 donation to that event. That science fair is going to be held April 3rd, or 1st through the 3rd at East High School. So if you're interested in going, you should look it up online and check that out. Um, yeah, we're pretty happy to be involved with the community. One other thing I want to mention is that because of these events and the public speaking that I've been doing up here, I wanted to improve because I didn't think my skills were right to the level where they should be. So what I did is I joined Toastmasters. Have you guys ever heard of that? Yeah? Okay. Well, I joined Greatland Toastmasters. They meet Thursday nights at 7 o'clock at the Frontier Building on C Street. They have a Facebook, and uh, you can Google the name. This whole group of table here is the, my club. And yeah, they have actually come tonight to evaluate my introduction tonight and give me feedback about how I'm doing. So... Uh, thank you. Thank you. Tell them that. Tell them that. So I'm actually extra nervous tonight because of this. But next Thursday, we're going to be doing our St. Patty's Day event. And I want to invite all of you to come to the club and check it out. If you have any interest in leadership skills, public speaking, or effective communication, I can tell you that it really works. I'm going to be speaking, doing my fourth speech that night, and we have several other people going to be talking too. So I encourage you guys to show up. Now I just want to invite Mike up onto the stage to do the trivia. Thank you guys very much. Hey guys. So I just wanted to mention two quick things that I forgot. So one thing is that Greatland has flyers. So if you're interested in the event next Thursday, Deborah has them over here. And the other thing is that what makes our club so great, Great Land Toastmasters, is the personalities. We actually have a lot of fun at these events. And these people are starting to become my friends, so it's really worth it. I may be biased, but I think it's the best club in Alaska. So, so now I just want to introduce our speaker tonight. Jeff is a former editor of the Harvard Lapoon, a lawyer, and a lifeline gardener who has written a weekly gardening column for 40 years. Science converted him to gardening organically. He has written two books, Teeming with Microbes, The Organic Gardener's Guide to the Soul Food Web, and Teeming with Nutrients, The Organic Gardener's Guide to Optimizing Plant Nutrition. 
which you can buy today. He has some books over here, and I'm pretty sure that if you beg him, he might sign it for you. <laughs> so I just want to bring Jeff up to the microphone. Thank you. So many years, they always talk about it. because in the Anchorage Dispatch used to be dealing as you know. They take your picture and they put it in the paper when you're not there, and they say he's gone for a week. And he'll be back, you know, he's on vacation. To me, that always said he's at home, rob his house. So that's why I've always done a column for all these people. But anyway, uh, I am the author of, of uh, uh, Teaming with Microbes um, and uh, another book called Teaming with Nutrients. And I just finished a third book, which is going to be coming out in January of 2017, called Teeny with Fun Ninja, which will be a lot of fun. Um, but anyway, uh, let's get down to business. This is an Alaskan sled dog doing his business. <laughs> Come on. Uh, now normally, I have to tell people who I am, you know, and I have to, have to get some creep. So I always tell people, I went to college with the guy that uh, did the victory show, the victory garden show, Roger Swain. He and I went to the same college, and I like to, I like to tell people that about 2% of our college class went on to become garden writers, and one of them became very famous and successful. Anyway, um, so I was really teaming with microbes. I was standing here with, with Roger talking about teaming with microbes, and one day I'm with my wife at a garden writers conference in Indianapolis, and we're at a restaurant I've never heard of called Boca de Beppo or something like that. Now this is a modern family kind of restaurant <laughs> where they serve you tremendous amounts of food, more food than you can possibly, possibly want to eat. And so we were sitting at the table, you can see all the kits they got in the background, and I was looking at this picture. And I was looking at the picture, my wife was with me, and I was thinking to myself, how do plants eat? I know how people eat. <laughs> how do plants eat? Now this is, you know, this is sort of a question that only, you know, kind of a weird guy might ask. I'm kind of weird, as my wife. Because uh, the first book I wrote was about how food gets delivered to the plant. How does the food get delivered to the plant? But nothing in the first book had anything to do with how that food gets into the plant. And frankly, as America's longest running garden columnist at the time, I, I had no idea how plants cook in their food. And so I thought about, hmm, interesting. I thought anyway, you know, this, the, the soil food web is how this stuff gets there. I always, you know, have to give a little quick refresher. The photosynthetic energy, at least half of it, is used to drip out exudates, these little chemicals that drip out into the, into the soil from the roots, and they attract bacteria and fungi, and the bacteria and fungi in turn attract nematodes and protozoa, who eat the bacteria and fungi, poop them out, right there in the, in the in all the stuff that they don't use, right there in the rhizosphere, and they feed the plant. So, you know, that's how the food gets to the plant. But how do they eat? Now, when you look up how they eat, because I did when I went home, you see all sorts of diagrams like this. Maybe you don't, but I do. And, and they always look the same. And they're always an explanation of how things on a piece of clay or a piece of soil end up on the root, but never how they get into the root. And it's called cation exchange. And, and it works like this. You have all these hydrogen ions that are sitting around on the root. And then you've got all the soil or clay particle that's holding all of this stuff. And what happens is you get an exchange. And so one of the hydrogen ions replaces one of the one of the nutrient ions and it ends up on the roof. Okay? You know, and all all, all the classes I ever took in anything gardening wise talk about cation exchange. And it's always about the soil particle, the compost particle, and the clay particle, never about how the stuff that's on those particles gets into the plant. So, hmm, okay, I'm still thinking about it, I'm working it, uh, and, and of course, then you get things like this. This is, a, this is what, what clay looks like in real life over on the left hand side, pretty cool picture. And then stuck in between all those little, little leaves of, of clay, 
they are all these wonderful little nutrients that the plant uses. All right, again, a lot of those pictures, a lot of these kinds of pictures, uh, let's see if I get this to go, uh, you know, where it talks about the transfer from the nutrients in the soil to, and that's what you get. That's in high school, that's in college. What does that tell me about how plants eat? No, not much. <laughs> so, so I'm kind of curious, and I wanted to know what happens next. What happens when all of those nutrients touch the root? And where do those hydrogens come from that do all of this exchanging? I had no idea. So, being the kind of guy I am, uh, I decided what I needed to do is a lot of research, and you don't want to just do research for nothing, so I decided I'd write another book. And, and so I did, and I started writing the book, and I discovered this is sort of like having a baby. Uh, you know, the first book's easy, you know, but the second book you sort of know what to expect, and it's not so much fun, you know. But in this instance, I'm writing about how plants eat, and I'm doing all sorts of research and stuff I have no idea, and it turns out this was, you know, curiosity killing the cat. <laughs> oh, come on, guys, you know. That's curiosity killing the cat. All right, you've had too much beer. Hold this lady beer. All right, anyway, after three years of research, while I'm writing my daily news columns, you know, and you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, I finally finished the book, and I send it in, and I think, ah, great, I got a book. Teeming with, with nutrients, how plants eat. What a great idea, you know? And so I got an idea, you know, how plants eat, what to feed them. That was my new title I was going to do. And I had a little cover and everything else, and I sent it in to Teeming, and to Timber Press, and of course, they say, no, no, we're not going to call it that. They have a big meeting, you know, and they sit around. And so they give it the name, Teeming with Nutrients, the Organic Gardener's Guide to Optimizing Plant Nutrition. Ah, you know, what were they thinking about? I don't know. Right, anyway, but the book came out, and it's there, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the book. This is, this is a, you know, this is not a how-to talk. This is kind of one of my crazy, wacky things, you know, and, and I have fun doing this. I hope you have fun listening. It. Have another beer. Don't take notes, because you're not going to need it. Trust me. So as long as humans have been around, uh, you know, uh, people have been, people have been uh, uh, feeding their plants. Now, it, it turns out that the Neanderthal man was the first guy to feed a plant. He had a lot to drink. And he got up in the middle of the night, and he went out, and the wife said, you pee over on that rock over there. And he said, the hell with that, she's not here. And he peed on a plant. And they got up a couple of days later, and the wife was there, and she said, look at this plant. It's so much bigger than it was before. <laughs> and so, you know, and so people have been doing that, and they continue to do this. So we know that plants do respond to, 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 to being fed. Now, for the longest period of time, people thought that plants actually ate soil, and that's how they ate. And in the 1800s, this was called the Humus Theory, and the biggest proponent of the Humus Theory, oddly enough, was a guy named Jethro Tull. Now, you thought Jethro Tull was a rock man, but in fact, and in fact, here, let me see if I can do this. I can hear you. Can. Anyway, uh, Jethro Tull turns out to have been a uh, English, an English guy. He was a lawyer like me in the in the, in the time of Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin. And he wrote about this theory called the humus theory, and in fact invented rototilling to pulverize soil, fine dust, so that the plants would have an easier time taking it in. So made sense, I guess, but there was no scientific proof for any of this stuff. There was just all this theory. And one day, a guy, a uh, German guy, uh, decides, no, that's wrong. Uh, and this is, this is him. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is the father of modern chemistry, but also <coughs> the father of uh, modern botany. And his name is von Liebig. And he stole his ideas from another guy uh, and, and became quite famous because what he determined was that if you've got soil that has all sorts of nutrients in it, the one that is the least amount, the, 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 that has the least amount, will be the one that controls how the plant does. So there, there's his little statement, and, and then he, you know, people do this. So if you fill this thing up with water, 
you know, it's that nitrogen that's controlling it. And if you don't have enough nitrogen in the soil, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to fill up that high. But there are limitations. And you can have all the, the phosphorus in the world that you, that you need. But if you don't have enough of the nitrogen, then you're not going to have a complete plant. All right, so he studied all this stuff. And, and he came up with this thing called the law of the minimum. Uh, and, and he decided, gee, okay, this is kind of interesting, maybe I can invent an artificial manure, because that's what they called fertilizers back then, artificial manure. And uh, he did. He invented and he worked on it for quite a time. He made a couple of serious mistakes with his first batch. He used insoluble nutrients, so the plant wasn't able to take them in. Uh, he thought nitrogen came from the air, so he didn't apply any nitrogen into the nutrient manure that he was making. And his third mistake was, he is the guy that came up with the idea that you have to sear meat in order to hold the juices in. And he turned out to be wrong on all three of these things. He corrected the first two, but he continued to sear his meat to keep the juices in. And it's still why people do it today, and it's not the right thing to do. But anyway, he ended up, around the 1850s, inventing artificial manure. And he started selling these artificial manures. Now, before that, you had to have animals on your property or your neighbor's property in order to be able to feed your plants. All of a sudden, you could buy artificial manures. And it was a, it was a big thing. And, uh, you know, OK, but that doesn't tell me anything about how plants eat. Right, they had these theories, and you know, they all worked this stuff out. How do plants eat? Well, I decided the history wasn't going to help me. What I needed to do was start studying some chemistry. All right, chemistry. Now, I don't know about you, you guys are all science geeks, but when I was in high school, I was lucky enough, I hope Mr. Tripp is not alive anymore, to have had a brother who had the same chemistry teacher. And he used the same multiple choice exams. <laughs> and I passed chemistry. So when I got to college and, and started to think about becoming a doctor, you know, oh my God, and I saw this methyl ethyl chicken wire stuff. And then nothing about it. I instantly developed a big hatred for chemistry and didn't learn anything in college about chemistry. In fact, my thoughts of chemistry can be summed up. And I think it's fair to put that up here because if you take a look at the statistics of the number of people who are becoming chemists in America, I think it's safe to say there are probably very few chemists in this room. So I'm going to tell you what chemistry is all about. It's simple. Chemistry is all about bonding. That's all it is, bonding. How things bond to each other is what chemistry is all about, OK? And we all know a little teeny bit about this stuff. We study the atoms, right? And we know about the, the forces that hold things together. What we've got are atoms. They don't really look like this anymore. They're kind of like these plasma things here. But we, we still think of them as planets electrons around that little center with the neutrons and the protons and the quarks and all that other stuff. There's supposed to be eight electrons, four pairs on the outer orbit, or that outer shell. And if there aren't eight electrons, the atom tries to do anything it possibly can so that they can bond with something else that can supply the electrons to make that shell complete. Bonding. That's what it's about. And of course, these are all electrical particles. You've got positives and negatives, and you've got the negatives on the outside of these electrons, and positives on the inside. So if you've got too many positive uh, negatives, uh, uh, too many positives on the inside versus the negatives, the positive and the negative. Thing. So you have charges on your on your things, and these charges like stick to each other. So you end up with bonding things together. So there are only three kinds of bonds. There's the ionic bond, where you've got one of the atoms says, give me that. I need your atom to complete mine. And so you have the ionic bond. You have covalent bonding, where they share equally electrons so that they each have eight in that outer shell. Or you have, you have polar covalent bonding, where they share, but they don't share equally. One side of the one atom hogs the electrons more than the other. So you've got three, it's all about bonding, only three kinds of bonds, okay? And it's really simple. You've got atoms, when they bond to each other, they become molecules, as you know. 
molecules, when they bond together, they become compounds. And it's these bonds that, that hold everything together. And lo and behold, about a year ago, they actually got a picture of these bonds, which blew my mind, because that is an incredible thing to see when you've been studying chemistry for all these years. There are the bonds that, that, that they photographed. They're getting better and better pictures. It's absolutely unbelievable. So it turns out this law of minimum is really the law of bonds. Because if you don't have enough nitrogens to bond with the phosphorus, it doesn't work. It's all about these chemical bonds. Fascinating. And there's some special bonds, particularly the bonds that hold the molecules of water together. Because water is an incredible substance that obviously all gardeners know is absolutely essential to what we do. I, I won't use a plastic container anymore. I'll worry about it. So it's, water is absolutely unbelievable stuff. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff. And from a chemical perspective, my goodness gracious, it's the universal solvent. It has these unbelievable properties which no other, no other compound, uh, compound has. So it has the ability of doing all sorts of things that other materials cannot do. And the reason why it does is because it's full of hydrogen bonds, which are complicated as hell. I'm not going to go into them, but water is full of hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are not as strong as those other three bonds that I showed you on the board. But when you have lots and lots of them, they can really hold stuff together. So, the water molecule you can think of as Mickey Mouse. Those two ears, right? And you got the mouth. Okay, so you got H2O. And it's and it's polar so that so that you've got a double plus charge up at the top and a single minus charge down at the bottom. Okay? So it's a polar covalent. Uh, and you've got these two hydrogens sharing electrons, and all sorts of cool stuff going on. But magic, it causes magic to happen. Because what happens is, these water molecules hold on to each other. Okay? And they hold on to each other, and they create this unbelievable, incredibly organized lattice. It's beautiful with all of these spaces in between the individual bonds holding everything. Yeah. And so you get the chain, and then the chain becomes you know, three-dimensional, and it, it's just spectacular. And it's these hydrogen bonds that hold everything together in this perfect regularity that creates surface tension and cohesion and adhesion. Beautiful stuff. So uh, this is why water has the ability to be able to be frozen, gas, Solid, gas, and liquid all at the same time. Other liquids, other li other materials can't do that. Water is spectacular, spectacular in that regard. And it's the universal solvent. Because it can surround with all of these bonds, it can surround anything and hold it inside. Again, because these hydrogen bonds, they may be moving and reconnecting all over the place, but there's so many of them that they hold this stuff together. And so water is the universal solvent. It surrounds stuff and it holds it in. It's, it's a solvent. Now the other thing you have to know about chemistry in addition to bonds is diffusion and osmosis. So when you have a concentration of molecules on one side of a permeal barrier, you all learned this in ninth and 10th grade, and you have, you have fewer molecules of the same stuff on the other side of the barrier, what happens is nature wants an equilibrium, and so the molecules go from one side of the barrier to the other, so that you end up with almost an equilibrium. It's always one off never gets the equilibrium, but you get this flow so that you get the equalization. And if it happens to be water doing this diffusion, it's called osmosis. There you go. One full high school chemistry class <laughs> in six minutes. <laughs> I'm going to give you a little college chemistry now, because it turns out that these atoms are obviously really, really small. They are teeny. <laughs> really teeny. Okay, so let's assume for a second that an atom is the size of a corn cone. Right? That would mean that a, a simple molecule would be the size of a, a pepper, a piece of fruit, an apple. 
uh, and that a complex molecule would be about the size of a squirrel, and a plant cell would be about the size of one of those tote containers that brings us our toilet paper every week down here in the corner. Right. And a tree, a tree made up of a series of atoms that were the size of a corn kernel would be the size of North America. And that tree contains 18 trillion cells. Who got it right? Okay, 18 trillion cells. All right, now, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. 18 trillion cells. So, just to keep things horticultural, uh, out of those 18 trillion cells, let's see. This is uh, one plant cell, 110 to 200 trillion atoms. They are really small. All right, now, uh, let's see what else we got. And of course, there's five to 10 of them in that period. This is amazing. <laughs> Simply amazing. Uh, I don't know what else to uh, do. So, then there's the periodic table. I guess if you're going to do chemistry, you've got to know something about the periodic table. And if you're doing chemistry with regard to plants, the only thing you have to know about the periodic table is that there are only 17 elements that a plant needs. 17 elements. And those 17 elements enable the plant to grow and to breed, you know, and, and repeat itself. 17 elements. All right. And there they are. Those are the 17 elements. And frankly, all the other stuff that you think your plant has taken in, everything else is just filler. <laughs> so for example, some of you are health nuts, and you eat, you eat kelp. Because kelp has 50 to 60 different elements in it. Wow, wait a minute, didn't I just say plants only have 17? Yeah, guess what? This isn't a plant. Ah, it's an algae. Good, good question. But in any case, 17. That's all you need, 17. So let's take a look here for a second. When you think about 17, uh, you know, you can't play a game of cards with 17 cards. How can you build plants? How can you build an orchid with 17 leaves? Unbelievable. Well, it turns out to be the math, uh, those 17 nutrients make a lot of different combinations. So you can make a lot of different kinds of atoms and molecules and compounds uh, using those 17. And of course, the amazing thing is that 95% of them are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, which is basically, you know, beer. So 95%. Um, the other 5% are these 14 uh, mineral nutrients. 14, that's all that, yeah. Unbelievable. And those are divided into macronutrients and micronutrients, depending on how much the plant takes in. I'm not gonna go into this stuff. If you wanna read about this stuff, you can read about it in the book. Um, you've never heard me talk about it once in my column in all 40 years, because who cares, right? <laughs> well, it turns out I've been wrong for 40 years. They only require 14 to 17 nutrients you need to test your soil, folks. That's the take home for everybody. Test your soils. If you don't test your soils, you don't know what the nutrients are in your soils. And we all know, because we're scientists, that information is power. And information means you've got to get the tests. You can't look, you can't tell, you can't stick your finger in, you can't eat the plant. You, you could sort of tell the plant's not doing well. But if you don't test your soil, you don't know what the plant's eating. All right, anyway, uh, those 17 nutrients can be divided into four kinds of molecules that are known as the molecules of life. And the first one are the structural, structural uh, uh, things, and those are the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And then you have nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. They make very special bonds, uh, and you know they can make uh, proteins and kind of stuff. You've got potassium and, and calcium and magnesium. These are regulators, uh, uh, and then you've got enzymes and proteins. So, we got all of these things that are being made. Uh, they're basically, you know, this is the science side of it here, but here's what they are. You've got lipids, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Now, all of those 17 molecules can be put into atoms and uh, compounds that end up in four different categories. 
Now, some of these nutrients are positively charged and some are negatively charged. The negative are anions. They tend to dissolve in the water. The water is uh, uh, you know, the solvent, and they're in the water. And if the water comes in contact with the root, it cuts the root. Otherwise, it goes into the water. It goes down to the Mississippi Delta. Uh, the, the others are, are cations, positively charged. And these are the ones that stick to the clay and uh, to the humus particles. And if you don't have a lot of clay in your soil, then you don't have a lot of nutrients. And if you don't have a lot of organic matter in your soil, you don't have any humus, and humus, so these are the things you need in your soil. All right, uh, and again, take home is test your soils. All right, enough of that. So, how? How? Oh, good question. You take a little bit uh, and you put it in a baggie. We used to be able to take it down to the Palmer, which just shut the agricultural uh, uh, place. We need to start bugging Governor Walker and uh, you know, the Ministry of Agriculture that we want to stay back. You send it away to one of any of the hundreds of different soil testing labs. You pick one. I like one. Uh, oh, God. It'll come to me before I leave tonight. Uh, and you send it in, you haven't tested it. It costs 20, 25 bucks, it's well worth it. And, and you send it into the right one, they'll tell you organically what you need to put down in your soil in order to meet the needs of the plant. So it's, it, it's certainly done. Um, uh, and in the book, there's a whole list I might add, of different, different places. So these 17 elements are everything you need. I like to tell people, you know, you may not be a vegetarian. But the meat you're eating is, and they're only eating these 17 elements, because that's basically, that's all we need. It's pretty amazing to think about it. 17 elements is supporting life. 17 elements. What the hell do we have all these other ones for? I don't know. Um, but they're there. Anyway, so uh, these plants take these elements, obviously, and make everything that they need. And basically everything that the animals who eat them need, we're the animals that eat them as well. Um, so each year, for example, they make a, enough glucose plants uh, to fill a 30 million mile long train that would go around the Earth 1,200 times. So that's a lot of glucose. The only, the only molecule that I can think of uh, you know, that's, that's more prolific in, in, the, in, in the world are K-cups. <laughs> <laughs> There's 8 trillion K-cups every year. Amazing. All right, anyway, so how do these things get made? Well, well, all of this, all of these nutrients, when they get into the plant, we're going to talk about how they get into the plant, all of these nutrients, you know, are just sort of floating around, and fortunately, we've got enzymes. And enzymes speed up the activity so that we can get things made. Uh, you know, they cause crashes to happen, not randomly, but organized. There were two cars in South Dakota when they invented automobiles. Two! And they had an accident. It's sort of amazing. Uh, but enzymes are capable of speeding up the, 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 the activity unbelievable numbers of times. Here's a great example. They discovered some dinosaur bones. Dinosaur bones that were like, you know, million years old. They were really old, and they had, they had collagen in it that wasn't active. And they, they activated the collagen, and in a nanosecond, the bones disappeared. So what, what, what was taking 400 million years, once they activated the stuff, instantly. And that's what happens with enzymes. Things that would take millions of years happen instantly, and plants are full of enzymes. So every individual cell in the plant contains a thousand different kinds of enzymes, at least, and about 10,000 of each one of those thousand different enzymes in that teeny little cell, of which there are 18 trillion in that birch tree that's right outside here. So they, they, they help things get put together. And of course, you know, we, we, we studied them when they were, you know, the lock and key theory of enzymes is one thought about them. Uh, this is how they depict them these days. They are incredibly complex uh, uh, proteins that have been folded up into these unbelievable, and now, now they're talking about quantum biology. So even these depictions don't even make sense. Quantum biology, instead of having uh, you know, a molecule go out that door in order to go find a Dodge Caravan to get in. 
you picture it as a wave, and it goes out no, no, that door, that door, that door, that door, all at once and finds the Dodge Caribbean. I mean, the stuff that people are beginning to study is so mind-boggling. We're going to keep on classic stuff, you know, just lock in key. 10,000 of each of a thousand different enzymes working away inside that little teeny cell. Whoa, it's unbelievable. I mean, and it's just things are moving in there and going crazy. All right, so you got all of this chemistry stuff going on there, but basically bonds, osmosis, small little things, enzymes, all right? So, so much for the chemistry, but that doesn't tell me how plants eat, so I needed to study a little cellular biology. Cellular biology, again, is not something that most people are familiar with, and so, you know, you have to start thinking about stuff and start appreciating it the way you don't normally. So, for example, again, you got to appreciate the fact that things are very small, and that there are 5 to 50 plant cells in a little period. And if each of us was a nanometer tall, as we think in terms of nanometers, we're talking several of Okay, uh, when we think about things, if each of us was one nanometer tall, everybody on the Earth was one nanometer tall, first of all, we'd all be equal, which would be very nice, right? Uh, but we would all be able to fit into that little pansy thing, and there'd still be lots and lots of room for big egos like Donald Trump's. So, uh, <laughs> unbelievable, we can get, get 6.5 billion people at a nanometer small into there. So we're talking about some small stuff here. You know, uh, a hair is 100,000 nanometers. Water molecule is less than a nanometer. Very, very, very small, right? And of course, when we think about plant cells, we think about plant cells this way, two-dimensional, flat. You know, you take home a little thing, you diagram it. You know, when you go back to school, you give it to your teacher, and you get an A+. Plus. But things aren't three-dimensional. These teeny, teeny, teeny little cells are three-dimensional. And you need to start thinking about them in three dimensions. So, uh, so they are definitely, they have shapes, they have uh, substance. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not these flat little things. And they are unbelievably complex, unbelievably beautiful little machines. And we're going to go through just a couple of them a little bit inside a plant cell, which is always depicted like this. Um, yeah, I have a little model at home every now and then when my wife's not looking, I take it out and I, I, I make my model plant cells. It's kind of cool. Uh, really kind of neat. The outside are cell walls. This is what a cell wall looks like. Cell walls are spun and laid down with these little spinning machines that are inside the plant and they're embedded in this membrane that's, that's next to the cell wall and they spin out stuff and they make this beautiful cell wall out of cellulose and they spin it out but it's not solid it's hollow so when you hear about people taking a plant that has lead in it oh you can't eat those plants they have lead in it they're growing near lead you say, so wait a second, I thought Lowenfeld said there's only 17 of us. I see lead there. Ah, the lead doesn't go inside the plant cell. The lead is in the plant cell walls, along with all sorts of other stuff. So that's where the stuff is. So when you hear, maybe you hear, oh, I'm growing marijuana and I'm using all sorts of terrible chemicals on it, but don't worry, I'm going to flush the plant out with a lot of water. What they think they're doing is flushing out all the stuff that's stuck to the cell wall. These have charges on them. And these cell walls are connected so that you can go into one of the cell walls and wander throughout the entire plant in the cell wall structures without ever going inside the cell. It's a whole area of the plant people don't think about because they think it's just a sort of a solid wall. And they are literally spun and spit out onto the wall. Um, and, and, and they come from this plasma membrane which sits right up next to the wall. Now the wall obviously protects the plant, holds the shape of the plant in the cell, and it gives it a little bit of protection. Here it's being spun, it's spit out, uh, and, and you get these beautiful, beautiful, beautiful plants. This is one of the pamphlets. So you can see this pamphlet right here is the cell wall pamphlet. Apple plastic pamphlet. And water goes through that pamphlet too. 
So water is held in the plant, not just inside the cell, but in the cell wall themselves. Um, all right, so moving on, we've got the cell wall holding the plant together. Up against the cell wall is this very fine membrane called the plasma lemma. Coolest little thing, uh, the plasma lemma protects the plant cell. Nothing goes into the plant unless the plasma lemma lets it into the cell. Nothing goes into the plant cell unless the plasma lemma lets it in. All right. It is a beautiful little uh, uh, plasma membrane, a plasma membrane. You go up to your television set and you touch it. You know, you get that. The northern lights is a plasma membrane. This is a plasma membrane that surrounds the cell. It's a, it's a double lipid membrane. And it looks like this, sort of like a mux oxygen herd. Uh, and it keeps, it keeps the stuff from outside the cell from going inside the cell, and the stuff from going inside the cell from going outside the cell, unless the plasma lemma lets it. There's a depiction here of what it looks like, sort of like salad dressing and water. You know, it just uh, and it's very, very thin. These are the phospholipid molecules, so they have this. I feel like that's attracted to water. It's got a tail which is hydrophobic. Obviously, it repels water, doesn't like water. So it looks like this. And what happens is that you've got these things and they're folded together, and you end up with the outside of it being hydrophilic, and then you've got the inside of it being hydrophobic. This is the outside of the cell, this is the inside of the cell, is the plasma lemma. So uh, I think the best way to depict it is you've got two pieces of white bread or water, whatever kind, and you put peanut butter on it, okay? And then you smash it together, all right? So <laughs> this stuff, this stuff, you put, you put this thing in milk, and this kind of gets mushy and blends in with the milk, and this gets mushy and blends in with the milk, but this prevents the milk from here getting over here. So, uh, you know, just think of a peanut butter sandwich. And what you end up with is this little system. And what gets through there? Well, it's a really, really, really small oxygen and CO2. You can get through without any problem. But if you're anything else, basically, it takes you forever to get through there, if you can get through it all. Water can sort of seep through a little bit, but not very fast and not very much. So these nutrients can't get in. You've got an impermeable layer. This is what it looks like. Again, you've got the heads and the tails, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but embedded in this layer are very, very special proteins and some sugar chains. The sugar chains are signal wires. So if you take a look at the top of the sugar chain, you laugh down at the bottom of the sugar chain inside the cell. Then you've got these other things that act like tunnels that allow the nutrients and the water to go into the cell. And they're like these <laughs> things that are finding the right. They're literally embedded in this plasma membrane. They go right through the plasma membrane. They float in the plasma membrane. This is what they look like. There they are. These are the embedded proteins floating in that plasma membrane known as the plasma lemma that every single one of those 18 trillion plant cells in that birch tree has lining just the inside of the cell wall. Every one of them. And these individual signal things are in every single cell. And different cells have different numbers of these embedded proteins that take in the nutrients. Now these are really kind of cool. They work based upon the bonds and the shapes of the nutrients that are involved. Each nutrient has its own kind of embedded protein to go through. So, uh, you know, they're really, really kind of neat. And again, it all has to do with those bonds. Now, so far, we're talking about chemistry and bonds. No. Not much. No life here. But what happens along the way? Who makes these embedded proteins? Each individual cell has to take nutrients and make the proteins that it puts into its plasma lemma. How does it do that? At what point do these bonds become life? I don't know, but I'll tell you what, 
it freaks me out. <laughs> so each one of these little uh, tunnels is individually made. Each one only allows one kind of nutrient to go through it. So you've got one. Boys only? Only boys are going through there. Not girls, not transgender, only boys are going through there. Uh, if you've got another, you know, it's just the way it works. Uh, you know, these are, some of them act like tunnels, uh, some of them act like involving doors, some of them act like catapults, all electrically operated using, using you know, uh, 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 ATP, the currency, of the, the energy currency of, of life. Unbelievably complex, but beautiful, beautiful machine structures. And, and you can have 15 or 20, uh, uh, you know, unbelievable the numbers that, that you can have. And some of them actually operate like motors, where they produce hydrogen and pump the hydrogen out into the world. Those hydrogens are then used to attach and power nutrient molecules in. So that's where some of the hydrogens that you know we wonder about come from. They're actually produced inside the cell and pumped out by these elegant machines that the plant has produced. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's simply incredible. And then there's a special series of embedded proteins, a special set of tunnels for water. For years, they thought, ah, water just goes through the membrane. No, it's so slow that the, the mathematical calculations didn't work. And then they discovered in, you, in, in, in humans these aquaporins, these tunnels that just allow water to go through. The water lines up one molecule after another and pours through billions and trillions of molecules a second through aquaporines into the cell. Uh, so you've got all of these particular uh, things. You've got enzyme activity making this stuff. Uh, and you've got all sorts of different ways for these things to get nutrients into the plant. These are the nutrients. It turns out all the nutrients have an electrical charge except for boron. So the electrical charge, which is caused by bonds or lack thereof, is obviously important. And all of these nutrients get in to their various tunnels based upon their bonds and their electrical charges in this way. So this is the outside plasma lemma. These are the various embedded proteins and the different kinds of activities. And they kinds of things. And you also got, once you get into the plant, cytoplasm inside the plant, and then you've got a big vacuole that also has a double membrane around it, that also has embedded proteins that things can go in and out of as well. So you've got this beautiful machine, not just a beautiful machine, in that birch tree there are 18 trillion of these beautiful machines operating simultaneously working together. Now, if you ever took a balloon and twisted it, you know, you sort of end up with two balloons, but they're really connected by that little hole where the twist was. It turns out that cells, these membranes, have lots of these little holes that connect to the cell next to them. Not to the outside world, but to the cell next to them. And, and these are called uh, plasma dismatic. Yeah, plasma is that up, and, and they connect the, the, the plants so that once you get inside a cell, let's say you get inside a cell down here, you're in the cell, you're in the cytoplasm of the plant, you can go through one of these little holes and travel anywhere you want in the plant, anywhere you want in the plant. It's like the plant is a beehive, a super nucleated organism. We don't think of plants that way, but that's sort of what they are. Each of these individual cells is operating like crazy. This is what they look like. So you got all these little holes out there. You know, it's sort of like going into a gated subdivision. Once you're in that subdivision, anybody ever done this? You go into a subdivision, you go, where the hell am I? How do I get out of here? Same thing happens inside, but they know where they're going. But it's the same thing. You're inside. You can be in the cell, in the cytoplasm. You can go from the cytoplasm of one cell to the cytoplasm of another cell, on and on and on. 18 trillion cells connected together. 
all connected, all the cytoplasm is connected and flowing together. So that when a signal goes into a root hair, in a nanosecond, a stomata at the top of that birch tree, 18 trillion, 18 trillion, you know, molecules, cells away, in a nanosecond it reacts. So everything is connected, you know? Amazing, again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we're inside the cell now, we're inside that membrane, and inside there is this cytoplasm. It's this soup. And, and the cytoplasm is everything that's inside the cell except for the nucleus, okay? And this soup is in there, and all these things are in there, and, and everything is connected by an incredible network of wires and tubes that things are transported along. So you've got wires everywhere, signals going in there all over the place, you've got tubes with stuff moving along on them, uh, and you've got all these beautiful little pieces that operate together in plants, obviously the most important are chloroplasts, okay? These are batteries. These are literally little batteries, and they have the ability to be able to pump up electrons and just punch them along and, 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 make, and make energy from sunlight. Again, quantum biology, which is something that people are beginning to study, tries to explain it in a better way than, than classic does, we're going to be hearing a lot about quantum biology, but it's so damn complicated, you know, that nobody's ever going to understand it. But these are spectacular, spectacular things. Now, remember I mentioned that big bubble on the inside, that other leg, membrane layer? That, that, that takes in poisons and, and, and whatnot, and a lot of times what it'll do, it'll take that poison, it'll make a little bubble by taking part of its own membrane and surrounding the poison, and then it'll take that bubble out to the outside membrane, Merge with the outside membrane, open up and dump all the crap out. Unbelievable. Uh, all the stuff that goes on inside these things is absolutely amazing. So you've got the uh, you've got mitochondria, and these are the power plants. You've got a dual system of energy production in plants. Interesting. So you've got chloroplasts, and then you've got these these things that we also have, uh, you know, these mitochondria that make ATP. And, and I won't go into it, but they're actually spectacular. Literally, you know, they, 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 they're little furnaces, and they just pump out energy. And that ATP is the currency of, of and there's one they look like. So you've got photosynthesis, uh, and you've got, you've got uh, uh, ATP being made. And both of these organisms, or not organisms, both of these cellular structures, organelles, the chloroplasts and the mitochondria, had their own membranes, double layer membranes, just like the plant cell itself does, their own DNA. Obviously, at one point in time, they were free living and ended up inside a plant cell, and the plant and cell and the, and the uh, two organelles went, hey, this works, let's do this again. And so that's what we have. As a result of endosymbiosis, uh, we've got living organisms inside plant cells that have become part of the plant itself. Again, amazing. Simply amazing stuff. Uh, you know, so let's continue on a little bit more. You've got the nucleus. Oh my gosh. So you've got this little nucleus with these spectacular pores on the outside of it, and nothing can get in there because you don't want to destroy the DNA, and only the DNA doesn't go out. Only RNA goes out because you've got to obviously duplicate stuff. You know, I uh, did all this study on some beautiful you think you have to imagine it. And all of a sudden, one day, two years ago, they published a picture of two, these are two, uh, uh, this is the DNA strand, I'm trying to say. Uh, little nanocarbon things, but so they take a picture of a DNA strand. Holy Komodo, you know, where's Watson when you need him? Look at this. You can actually see the double helix in the dime thing. I mean, where are we going? I'll tell you where we're going. Pretty soon we're going to be able to take our cell phones out, you know, and take a little snap of our hand. Oh, that's a DNA leak. This is amazing stuff, folks. <laughs> I'm not sure how much of it explains how much plants eat, but it's silly, amazing stuff. So then you've got, you've got the endoplasmic uh, reticulum. ER. You have the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. 
and they are attached to the to the to basically to the uh, um, nucleus, and stuff comes out. Oh yeah, and stuff comes out. <laughs> you get all this incredible stuff. So what happens here is that nutrients come in, enzymes deliver them to the endoplasmic reticulum, and all sorts of stuff is constructed. So you get all the stuff, ribosomes are all over the places. So DNA uh, is duplicated, RNA comes in here, goes into these little ribosomes and duplicates stuff. So it's incredible. So this is how it all looks and uh, all connected right onto the edge. So you can make something here, you can use it inside the cell. Or you can ship it out of cell. So a lot of the stuff that's made by those 10,000 different kinds of enzymes, a thousand of these different ones, goes right in the cell. But a lot of it is shipped off someplace else. And it's shipped off someplace else as a result of the googly body, which is a little thing that labels where it's supposed to go. It kind of folds it in the right way. And then you've got these, you've got these uh, uh, duplicate machines, these ribosomes that are like, like little knitting machines that we have as kids, you know, where you come out the bottom. Uh, and where you take the RNA, and you transcribe it inside this thing, and it, it puts in little pieces, and it cleans and stuff. Unbelievable how it duplicates and stuff, just like those little knitting machines over there, you know. Uh, they're absolutely spectacular. Here's uh, some, some membrane made in a ribosome. This is the memory you know, right? Unbelievable, they can take pictures of these things. Now, I have a picture I took at the Chicago airport when you go between the Alaska Airlines terminal and the It's just incredible stuff. It's just really unbelievable. And so the googly apparatus is it's all fixed together in this box, you know, and they label it and they ship it out. And then you've got these, lot, these, these beautiful tonoplasts. The tonoplast is, is uh, you've got a little layer on the inside of that membrane. Um, and it's a double lipid paper. You got a cytoskeleton with all of these infrastructures for, for moving things around, webs of stuff and tubes and stuff all over the place. And then you've got active fibers and microtubules and unbelievable. And it sort of looks like this in a real in a real cell. And then uh, like this, and I'm going as fast as I can. So this is. Depictions of cells. <laughs> so you can end up with a pumpkin growing 40 pounds in a night. Now think about that. Each of those individual cells is doing its thing and adds 40 pounds. I'm sorry, I don't even know how to explain it. I mean, it's just it's crazy. Alright, so then you got, I'm, I'm going to finish, I'm going to finish, I'm going to make it. Uh, so then, you guys want to go home right away? Oh, all right. So then, let's just pretend that a cell was the size of a football stadium, okay? So you go in there, you're going to go in the cell, you walk in the cell, and oh my god, it's noisy in there, and there is explosions and light bursting everywhere, it's incredible. And the first thing, you walk through this wall about this big, that's the cell wall, and then there's this little teeny book about this one, that's the plasma lemma, and you figure out a way to get through one of those little holes, and you're in there, and there are all these wires and tubes and things moving around in there, and noise and explosions and light changes, and, and oh God, look out, all the stuff flying all over the place, and holy crap, the nucleus is 50 feet, you know, 50 feet diameter inside the middle of that little football field is pumping out all on the lid. So let me just show it, give you a little depiction. I'm going to skip one of them so I get the right one. I don't know. So, look, hey, embedded memory. This is a new thing. Look at this in there. Look at this in there. Look at this in there. Everything that you need, everything that animal needs, it eats it. 
and well, we put it like a super Unbelievable! And this is happening in that tree in every one of those 18 trillion cells. It's unbelievable. But I'm not done yet. Almost. <laughs> Almost. Because you know, I learned a lot about me, but I didn't learn enough. So I had to learn a little bit about, about how plants work. <laughs> Where are we so, so I had to learn how to work, and I had to learn about groups. I'm just going to say one thing. You talk about border cells that could be sloughed off as these things grew. Those are not, they're not sloughed off. What those are, those are real cells. And they're, when the group gets wet, anything over 98% water makes these things fall off the root. And they act like your white blood cells do in your blood. They fall off the root. We used to think they were just dead mucilage. No, they can live for months in a hydroponic system by themselves. What they do is, when something bad comes, a pathogen or even a heavy metal, they break this mucus that covers it. So they can't get it out. Unbelievable! Unbelievable! And you got these root hairs, and you want to want to have one big root hair, so you got chemicals that make it so that you don't get root hairs all over the place. And, and what happens is because of that wonderful power of water holding these bonds together like a rope, one molecule after another, you get water comes into the system, you need an apple inside the cell, it can go in and then go up into the system. Oh my God! And how that works is spectacular. But what you've got is this little strip in the middle of every root called the Caspian strip that only lets what it's allowed in in. Can't get through the plasma lamella, not get through the Caspian strip, not going into the plant, blah, blah, blah. I can talk about all this stuff. The beautiful system, the way this all works. You've got, you've got <coughs> one molecule coming into the roots and a chain of molecules going all the way up to the stomata. Okay? The stomata opens up, you get evaporation. One molecule evaporates out, and one molecule is pulled up out of the soil. Fifteen evaporate out. 15 are pulled up out of the soil, so you get this incredible chain. And this chain, it, it runs the whole plant. When you, when you end up having a lot of sugar in one area, you get this osmosis effect. All the water runs to dilute the sugar, and it moves stuff around in the plant. We'll go into it, but it's so something. I get all sorts of other stuff. Talk about it. Anyway, it's magical. It's magical. <laughs> and every single cell in the plant is in within four cells of the water. So it can always get water. And remember, they're all connected to each other anyway, so it doesn't make a bit of difference. And then you get this unbelievable stem cell growth. So here is a broccoli stromata being developed. So what you've got are stem cells And as a result, you end up with spectacular flowers. But only if you've got enough boron, just a couple of molecules, because the pollen tubes will work if you don't have boron. And you get spectacular flowers. It's just absolutely unbelievable. I always like to show this little green six that they get grown. All this result is 17 nutrients. Yay, spectacular. All right, think I'm finished on that. I got just two or four more minutes, because this is where I hear Dr. Susan. You know, Horton hears a who.
one goes to the end of one goes to the end of one. Which one of these is the root? And which one of these is the CD that is in the other? Now, here's, here, here's a cell with, 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 with uh, nucleus. Soccer ball. What's the difference? You know, here's the googly body where, where individual molecules and compounds are labeled and, and then addressed and then shipped away. Just like FedEx does. Exactly the same. You know, this, this system of, of uh, membranes that only one thing can get through. What's the difference between that and the salmon stream? Only one family of salmon gets into that stream. Only one. What's the difference? It's the same exact thing. Now, what's the difference between the subdivision and the leaf vein system? And the, what's the difference between the transportation system inside a cell you know, and the transportation system in a toy? Look, here's, here's fractals and here's cells. And they're exactly the same. You can't tell which is which. Here's the actin fibers of a cell. Actin fibers are these communication networks inside a cell. Is the port of musk? What's the difference? Exactly the same. You know, uh, June, June was walking with me and I said, wait, we've got to stop and get these pictures. Those look like enzymes to me. Exactly like enzymes. And they act, operate the same way. They act just like enzymes. There's no question. All right. Solar cells. What's the difference? Huh? Hey, hey, how about storage organelles? The storage of storage in the room. It's exactly like our world. And listen, these are mitochondria. You can't tell me <laughs> there isn't some kind of mitochondria. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not coincident. Uh, no. Which one of these is the root? Which one of these is the starfish? You know, plasma, plasma, plasma does not between two cells. I mean, come on. What's the difference? <laughs> You know, it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. Here, here are the, here are the uh, vermilion cliffs. It's like this at the Salt Lake City Airport. Uh, you know, what's the difference? Embedded proteins. Look at this. It's just incredible to me. The sun, a plant cell nucleus. What's the difference? The aurora borealis and the plasma lemma. What's the difference? Wow. You know? Here is, you know, the Hedron Collider or whatever the hell, you know? Look at the inside of the cell. And look at this. Here's cellulose. Here's cellulose, right, being made. What's the difference between that and this cellulose being made and sprayed on the wall? It's exactly the same, you know? Here is a coastline, right? You tell me, okay? Hey, look at this. This is the internet traffic between Europe Europe and the United States. And they have the active fibers in a single cell. Ooh, pretty freaky. Because Dr. Seuss was right. Look at this. <laughs> Universe cell. Huh? So, here's the take home. When you're out there working in your garden, definitely be thinking about those thinking trillion different cells with a thousand different enzymes. 10,000 different ones of each one of them. Be thinking about all the three dimensional organelles or insect elements. Think about the unbelievable complexity. But every now and then, make sure that you stand up and shout out real loud. Because they're listening. <laughs> Thank you very much. We just want to thank you for your presentation and give you a certificate for presenting and a copy button with our logo. So this is Hannah Marsh. Just come look at the big watcher. I think that was the most informative uh, talk we've ever had. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to bring, bring Mike up real quick for any further couple of quick 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 announcements and we'll let you guys go. <laughs> He does have books for sale, so please stay by and help him out with that.